good morning. <laughs> Please stand and take your hymnals and turn to 352, Oh, the Deeply Loved Jesus. together. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, and most precious Holy Spirit, we have gathered here in your house today to worship you, to sing your praises, to hear your word proclaimed in both song and word, to fellowship with other believers, to return a portion of what you've given us <coughs> unto you. But mostly, Father, we've gathered here this day for the Holy Spirit to touch us, to change us, to transform us, to conform us into the very image of Christ, your Son and our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now if you'll turn over to 327, the old rugged cross.
great singing. If you, as you remain standing, if you'll take your bolts and turn to the inside cover, we will recite together our Lenten affirmation of faith, which is based on Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This affirmation says, We believe in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the very form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Therefore he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and was born in human likeness. Being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Hence, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name Jesus, every knee shall bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess to the glory of God, Jesus Christ is Lord. This we believe. You may be seated as you do so. Join me in this time of prayer. <coughs> pray together. Father, we come before you yet again, thankful and grateful for your goodness, for your mercy, for your love. And Lord, we, we know that you are perfect and that your ways are above our ways, and we stand in awe of that perfection. And Lord, we know that we fall so short of that. Each and every day, sin creeps into our lives. Sometimes we even invite it in. But it's there, Father, and it distorts who we are. For we are intended to be created in your image, and yet we allow sin to deform us into something else. So we come this morning knowing of your forgiveness, of your mercy, and your grace, and we confess our sins. Those things which we do that are not in accordance to your will, to your word, to your desire for our lives. And Father, sometimes those sins are things we do. Other times our sin is simply failing to do the good that you called us to do. Whatever our sin is, Father, we confess it before you and we seek your forgiveness. And as I seem to do week after week, Father, I, I seek more than mere forgiveness for us. I seek real transformation. I seek for us to become more and more like Jesus. I seek for us to find victory over the sin that's in our lives. And through the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells us, we believe that it's possible. So we thank you for forgiveness and the new chance, the next chance to be like Jesus. And Lord, as we become more and more like him, our heart begins to break for things that break his heart. Things like war, not only in the Ukraine, but everywhere military violence exists. For things like injustice, for things like poverty, pain, and rampant disease. We lift, we lift up those who are suffering from any of these things today, Father. We lift them up and we ask that your comforting hand be there with them through the trial, but we're also asking that you bring it to an end that you bring peace and wholeness and wellness to an end. We're here, Father, towards the end of what, at least what I hope is the end of a pandemic. Though COVID will probably always be with us, but the pandemic, the emergency is over. And I'm thankful for those in this congregation who have recovered from that. We praise you that your mighty hand was upon them. Lord, there's still others that are battling illness not COVID related, and we ask that your hand bring them through as well. And that you bring us through every trial and tribulation in our life, whatever it may be. We ask these things, Father, because we believe that you have the power to bring about these things. Even our request of you represent our praise of you, for we would not ask if we did not believe you had the power. Now, if you would, please join me in 
the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. invitation to give generously this morning comes from the book of Hebrews and it says through him that is through Christ let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that confess his name do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God let us now honor God through our giving
Let us pray together. Father, once again we come before you thankful and grateful for all the, the good that you pour into our lives. For family and friends, for provisions that we need, for the abundance that you have poured upon us, we give you praise. And one of our ways to say thank you for this abundance is to return a small portion of that unto you week after week. And I am so thankful, Father, that as a congregation, we eagerly participate in that opportunity. That we return unto you and we say thank you. We return unto you and we say we trust you to continue to meet our needs. We return unto you and then get to sit back and watch the glory of your work go forth. I thank you, Father, for all that you've given us. And I thank you for all that these, your people, return unto you. Take these offerings that came online or in person or through the mail this week. Take them and bless them and multiply them so that when it's all said and done, there are leftovers that allow us to do even more. In your holy name I do pray. Amen. You may be seated and you do so. Our children can come forward and Miss Donna will be here. <coughs> We've got a lot of kids here today. Hi. How are y'all? Got a really young group. We're going into Lent. And Lent is a time when Jesus fasted and prayed and tried to draw closer to God in preparation for his public service. And it's a time when we're supposed to seek God. Because we were made to seek God. We were made for God's purpose for us. None of us are the same. We all have different purpose. We all have different things that we're supposed to do in our life. But all we all have this hole in our heart that we're born with that gets filled with God. And some people, when they go out, they're looking for God, but they find something else. They're trying to fill that with something else. And, Steve was talking today, he might be trying to fill that with a spouse, you know, but that doesn't fill that hole. You have to find God to be able to fill it perfectly and to have a purpose in it. For several years, I've heard about people being fascinated with the fact that there might be people on other planets. And they even have like a TV channel dedicated to that. And we even had a report from the government saying, you know, UFOs exist. And I've always wondered why people were so fixated on that, why they were thought so much about that. And yet, you notice that aliens are never stupid. Those aliens are always super, super smart. And they think that if they can interact with that alien, that person from the other planet, that their lives are going to be transformed. And they think that, some of them think that if, if the, those people from the other planet take them with them, they don't grow older. Sound kind of familiar, doesn't it? You know, they're looking for something all-powerful and all-knowing that will transform their lives and then will allow them to have everlasting life. But they're just looking for God, but they're looking in the wrong place, right? And then there's other people that have gotten really into computers and they're into computer learning and AI and they, they think they're gonna make this supercomputer out there someday. And this supercomputer is gonna know so much and it's gonna be so smart. And they're gonna be able to build this thing called a metaverse around it. Meta for short. And they're actually going to put a chip in their head and they're going to be connected to this thing and this thing is going to make all their decisions for them and let them know what they're supposed to do in their life. You know, and that they'll be able to, maybe even someday, some of these people think that they're going to like just live there. They're going to live in this virtual perfect place somewhere. But the problem is they made that place themselves, right? It's like the people in Babel who tried to build a tower to go all the way to heaven, but they built it themselves, and that didn't work for them. 
And I don't think metaverse is going to work for these people looking for their perfect place and their perfect knowledge either. Right? Because we got to look to God for that. And there's a good reason for that. Because they're missing one thing here. In Jeremiah 29 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. If we're going to have hope and a future, if we're not going to live in fear and anxiety, if we're going to have something that we're working toward, we're going to be, have a public, public service ourselves that we've been designed to do, we got to look to God for that. And we got to help other people that are looking for God in the wrong place. Hi. How you doing? Okay, so let's say our prayer. Lord, we hope that we can stay focused on you. That we can serve you in the way that we're supposed to serve you. That we can stay dedicated to filling that hole in our heart with you with your perfect fit so that we can be complete and whole and have hope for joy and purpose in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now if you'll stand and turn in your hymnals to 319, verses 1, 2, and 4 of Near the Cross. Begin, excuse me. <clears throat> a man began visiting a bar regularly, and when he was there, he always ordered three beers. 
no more or no less, every time he walked in the door, three beers. Now, after several weeks of noticing this habit, the bartender asked the man why he always ordered three beers. The man answered, well, you see, it's like this. I have two brothers who've moved away to different countries, and we promised each other that as long as we are alive, we will always order an extra two beers whenever we drink as a way of keeping that family bond. Several months later, noticing that the man only ordered two beers, the bartender leaned toward him and whispered, please accept my condolences on the death of one of your brothers. The man replied, you'll be happy to hear that my two brothers are alive and well. It's just that I myself have decided to give up drinking beer for Lent. <laughs> While many, many equate the season of Lent with giving up something they dearly love, as I wrote in last week's newsletter, Lent is actually a time of fasting, repentance, and preparation for the coming celebration of Easter. Now, I did not grow up celebrating Lent, so this was a, a new concept for me when I first joined the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. But with all that said, I'm going to ask you to please rise and embody your spirit in honor of God's Word recorded in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. Here, Mark writes, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him, that is Jesus, the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be God. Let us pray together. Lord, we come before you yet again and ask you to speak to us ever so clearly this morning, Father. Speak to us in ways that we understand exactly what you would have us to know. Speak to us in a way that drowns me out if necessary. So your true message will meet the hearts, will reach the hearts and minds of these your people that you've gathered in your house on this very day. In your holy name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the ancient doctrines of the church is that Jesus is both fully divine, that is, he's 100% God, and fully human, 100% human. Now, those of, us, those of us in the church generally do not struggle too much with Jesus being divine, but we struggle with his humanity, of him facing trials and temptations like he had no option but to do good. Now, the world, on the other hand, those outside the church, have no real trouble with Jesus' humanity. It's his divinity that they struggle with, and the fact that he was indeed sinless and is a sacrifice for their sins. But that, that conflict between the dual nature of Christ is hard for us to grasp. How can you be 100% of two different things? But Scripture and church history assures us that is true. From one gospel or another, Jesus being tempted by Satan in the wilderness is, is in the wilderness following 40 days of fasting is always the scripture for the first Sunday in Lent, or at least always the gospel reading for the scripture in the first Sunday of Lent. The gospel of Mark, if you're not aware of this, the gospel of Mark is the shortest of all four New Testament gospels. Mark wrote his stories very concisely. Unlike many preachers, he practiced an economy of words and got right down to business. This writing style leaves his gospel like a soup stock that has been reduced. The flavors intensify. This is certainly true of his account of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. 
Both Matthew and Luke go into detail as they describe the interaction between Jesus and the devil, listing the three temptations that occurred, and even quoting the scriptures Jesus used to, to rebut Satan's challenges. But Mark reduced the whole encounter to just two verses, in which he tells us that the first thing that the Spirit of God did after Jesus was baptized, the very first thing the Spirit of God did was to drive Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Having to be driven implies that Jesus did not want to go into the barren wilderness. This is the human Jesus. Did not want to go into the wilderness, into the desert. Few people do. That includes us. Few people enjoy the wilderness, and yet the wilderness is God's classroom. It's in the trials and struggles of life that we learn not only more about who God is, but who we really are. Few people, though, want to go. Nonetheless, does that not seem a little odd to you? I mean, that the Spirit of God, who was to strengthen Jesus throughout his ministry, the Spirit of God, before he had preached his first sermon, before he had called his first disciple, before he had performed his first miracle, the Spirit of God would drive Jesus in the wilderness to be tested by Satan, and that, it, that is what all three of the synoptic gospels proclaim. Now, I don't know. It seems to me like I... I've run across a lot of Christians over the years that prayed that God would keep them out of the wilderness, keep them out of trials and temptations, and yet God seems to use those times all the time, and he did so with Jesus. Now, if you'll notice what I said just a moment ago, I used the word tested instead of tempted, tested instead of tempted. To be tempted is to be enticed to sin, which is certainly what God intended, or excuse me, what Satan intended when he approached Jesus after 40 days of fasting. He wanted Jesus to sin, to sin, because if he did, the whole plan of redemption crumbled before it even began. Satan wanted Jesus to sin. <coughs> excuse me. But when he drove Jesus into the wilderness, the Spirit of God knew that Jesus would not sin. But he wanted the human Jesus to know that as well. The divine Christ knew, but the human Jesus needed to know that he would not give in to sin. A test is different than a temptation in that a test is designed to reveal something to the one being tested, in this case, to Jesus. The Holy Spirit drove the human Jesus into the wilderness so that Jesus would more fully understand the pronouncement of God the Father at his baptism. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In the other two synoptic gospels, the devil introduced at least two of his temptations or tests by saying, if you are the Son of God. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. If you are the Son of God, turn these breads and these rocks into bread, stones, whatever it was. You know what I'm trying to say. If you are the Son of God, jump down off this temple and impress everybody. If you are the, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, if you are the Son of God, bow down to me and I'll give you everything you came for, and the cross won't even be necessary. Holy Spirit sent Jesus into the wilderness so he would understand just exactly what God the Father said when he said, you are my beloved son. While Satan intended his three so-called temptations for, for evil, God intended them for good. And that good was to help Jesus fully comprehend his divine identity. This comprehension would be necessary for Jesus to accomplish his mission of redeeming lost and dying people from the grip 
of sin. And a sinner cannot rescue a sinner from sin. And Jesus needed to understand that he was not a sinner. Jesus swiftly moved from his baptism by John the Baptist and to his wilderness temptation and from there straight into his mission and earthly ministry. The Gospel of Mark, or in the Gospel of Mark, these three scenes occur, uh, they're sort of strung together like a, a string of firecrackers. I mean, the boom, boom, boom. Here it is. Three verses and this is over. Many verses in Luke and John. Mark just boom, boom, boom. As I indicated earlier, what is puzzling is the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, when, when Jesus rose from the water following his baptism in the Jordan River, Mark says the heavens were torn apart. That is, they were aggressively ruptured. And down from this gaping hole in the sky, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in the form of a dove. And then that same Spirit immediately drove Jesus into the wilderness. Jesus was thrust, pushed, shoved, pushed by the Holy Spirit of God. The violent laceration that split open the heavens then propelled Jesus into the desert so that he might be tempted and strengthened. Don't miss the last part of that. That he might be tempted and strengthened. Truthfully, because the season of Lent requires us to search our souls, we sometimes have to be driven by the Holy Spirit to truly examine our lives. No wonder we typically prefer Advent over Lent. For reasons we do not generally understand, the Holy Spirit desired this period of temptation for the fully human Jesus. In the all-knowing mind of the Spirit of God, Jesus need to undergo, needed to undergo a strength test. Not to see how physically strong he was, but to see how spiritually strong he was. Both God the Father and God the Holy Spirit knew how strong God the Son was, but they wanted the human Jesus to know as well before he launched his public ministry. The test of being tempted by the devil would give Jesus the assurance he needed, not only as he began his ministry, but as he finished his mission on the cross of Calvary. You may recall Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane the night he was arrested, the night before he was crucified. He had left the disciples to pray, and he went a little farther up the path, and Jesus prayed, not once, but three times. My Father! Jesus prayed with such urgency that drops of blood dripped from his head, from his forehead, remember? My Father! If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Around the familiar King James, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus had the strength to secure the salvation of all who place their complete trust in him and the atoning work of his sinless life, death, and resurrection. There's a story I read several years ago about the construction of the Union Pacific Railroad across the American West. This took place back in the mid to late 1800s. The construction crew came to a massive canyon that required the building of an extremely large trestle bridge. It was the largest bridge ever constructed at that time in history. And after the enormous structure was completed, the construction engineer wanted to test the bridge. So he loaded a train with extra cars and equipment. Altogether, it was more than double the normal payload of a train. With all eyes upon him, the engineer then drove the overloaded train to the middle of the bridge, and then he did something strange. He parked it there, and he left it for 24 hours. One of the railroad workers asked the engineer, are you trying to destroy the bridge? 
No, the engineer replied, I want to make sure that the bridge won't break. I think that story explains the temptation of Jesus fairly well. Satan was trying to get Jesus to sin, but not the Holy Spirit that drove him out there. Satan wanted Jesus to know. Scratch that. The Holy Spirit wanted Jesus to know that he would not break under the weight of sin and the cross. The Holy Spirit drove Jesus in the wilderness of 40 days to test and reveal to him his resolve to obey the Father's will. That, that testing strength, strengthened the human Jesus just like fire strengthens iron. The testing strengthened the human Jesus. The same is true for us. Look back at your life. You grew in every trial you faced. You may not have grew where you thought you were growing. You may not have enjoyed the growing process, but you have grown in every trial you faced. You were strengthened. The trials Jesus underwent at the hands of Satan sharpened his discerning spirit. The same is true for us. And by the way, the best way to, to counter temptation, whether it's from Satan, let me, let me tell you something. Satan doesn't bother tempting me anymore. He gave up a long time ago because he knows I can come up with enough temptations on my own that he's got other people to work with. All of our temptations aren't from Satan. We are ourselves our biggest tempters. And here's the thing that works best for every temptation. The same thing Jesus used with Satan. Scripture. Scripture. You can't mess up when you follow Scripture. You can't. Now you can do like Satan. You can twist it and make it say anything you want to say. But if you earnestly follow Scripture, you can overcome temptation, whether it be from Satan, somebody else, or from internally. At the, at the end of his ordeal, of this ordeal we've read about today, the human Jesus better understood his earthly purpose. And the same is true for us. Jesus' baptism, Jesus' temptation, Jesus' ministry. If these three things have one thing in common, it is this. Throughout, Jesus remained absolutely focused on obedience to God. Absolutely focused. He submitted to John's baptism, not because he needed to repent of any sin in his life, but in order to perfectly align himself with God's will for humanity. Jesus' period of temptation sharpened his understanding of what his purpose was and who he served. Those 40 days in the wilderness helped Jesus to hardwire the movement from his baptism to his ministry. And throughout his earthly mission, Jesus remained obedient to God. Even unto the cross, as his prayer in the garden revealed, Jesus' purpose did not seriously waver despite the repeated temptation to do so. We are now five days into the 40-day season of Lent. This annual season provides an opportunity for each of us to reflect upon the state of our spiritual health, our own spiritual health. I'm not reflecting on yours. I don't encourage you to reflect on that of your spouse, of your children or your parents, grandchildren or grandparents. Reflect upon your own spiritual health. To do this reflection, we do not have to relocate to a desert somewhere. But we, need, but we do need to spend some time alone talking to God and meditating on His Word. You can't do a serious reflection without taking the time. Can't be done. 
Can you do a quick summary? Oh, I'm fine. And go on. Because if that's what you do, you're wrong. You're not fine. You need to stop. Spend some time alone with God. Turn off that blasted television set. Lay down the... I don't know if anybody still reads the newspaper, so maybe we don't need to lay down the newspaper anymore, but get along. Spend some time with God. Talk to Him. Read His Word. Find out where you are. And as we do, as we do this, we need to ask ourselves, how is our obedience to the will of God? How is our obedience to the will of God? You've heard me say many times in the past that saving faith always produces obedience. So how is our obedience to the will of God? Be completely honest with our assessments. Judge yourself like your eight-year-old would. You know, they can be brutally honest. Like Jesus, we often face choices or temptations. With that in mind, during this holy season of preparation, we need to identify how we connect God into our decision-making process. Perhaps we need to ask ourselves what influencers or tempters are leaning, leaning on us. Like Jesus, our guidance comes from our baptismal identity. On that day, on that day, we were claimed by God. We are declared a child of God. That identity is our North Star, our guiding principle of life. As we negotiate the wilderness landscape, we live among many modern wild beasts and other dangers threatening to our spiritual welfare. And our old foe, the devil, still constantly presents us choices and temptations. Unlike Jesus, we err and stumble. We often make the wrong choice and fall to temptation. We sometimes disobey. And yeah, this word our modern culture doesn't like a lot. We sin. We sin. Our hope sometimes wavers into despair. We make choices based on selfish fears and motivations. But baptism's promise of grace is there for us. It reminds us that no one, no one can snatch us from God's hand. A young boy was at a grocery store. He was standing near an open box of cookies there on the cookie and cracker aisle. And as the grocer approached the boy, he asked, What are you up to? Nothing, replied the boy. <laughs> Nothing, echoed the grocer. Well, it looks to me like you're trying to take a cookie. You're wrong, mister, said the boy. I'm trying not to take a cookie. When it comes to temptation, your chuckle lets me know you can relate. Trying not to take a cookie. It seems that I sometimes invest more effort in trying not to do wrong than I do in trying to do right. Did you catch that distinction? Sometimes I discover I put more effort in trying not to do wrong. That's a tough way to live, you know that? You're carrying the whole burden of the law with you every step of the way. Trying not to do wrong. I suggest that we spend this preparation time of Lent trying to do right. And you'll discover that's not near the burden to drag behind. The road that Jesus calls us, calls us to follow is a narrow road, a road that is not easy and in fact is often quite difficult. Why? Because temptations abound on that road. As followers of Christ, we are called to follow a road where we are to submit ourselves to God. A road that asks us to sacrifice ourselves, our time, our energy, and our possessions for Him. Jesus asks us to travel the hard road. 
a road that always leads us by the mount of temptation. Always. Jesus asks us to travel that hard road because at the end of that road is our final reward. It is heaven. It is eternity with him. So when we are tempted by the devil to take the easy way, what will we do? You know, that's, a, that's another appropriate question for our, our Lenten journey. When tempted by the devil to take the easy way, what will we do? Will we take the easy way, the way of little effort, or will we follow the example of Jesus and take the hard road, the way traveled by him, the way of sacrifice, the way of service, the way of the cross? As we deeply ponder this question in preparation for the celebration of Easter, remember that the baptismal promise of God's steadfast love is our shelter in the wilderness. You see, too often we separate Jesus' baptism and the temptation, but Mark forces us to put them together. As we go through life, the baptismal promise of God's steadfast love is our shelter in the wilderness. This promise carried Jesus through his trials and temptations, and it will carry us through ours as well. May the trials and temptations the Spirit of God places before us strengthen our faith. Our faith. Strengthen our faith. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, the power of your word, the promise of your word. And Lord, I have tore it up trying to get it out here, especially these last few minutes. So I pray that your spirit has translated this into the hearts of these, your people, that they gathered here. And that we come out of this day, and indeed every day in this season of Lent, more and more like Jesus because we surrender more and more to him as we claim our identity in Christ and the baptism of the Spirit that is upon us. In your holy name I pray. Amen. If you'll stand and turn to 312, verses 1, 2, and 4 of Calvary Covers It All.
thank you all for being here this day. And as always, I pray that God has blessed you in some way uh, for your uh, for your presence here. And um, I'm going to take a slight diversion here, but I saw on Facebook earlier this week that Jill Kerr had a birthday this week. And I'm pretty sure Facebook is correct based on all of her family being here. But I wasn't 100% positive when I saw the post because it said you were 68 years old and I didn't think you were near that old. No comment, okay. I'll, I'll get my comeback later. With that said, receive now this benediction. Believe in the risen Jesus and live accordingly by examining your life, checking your obedience to Him so that you can line your life up with His will and know the abundance of life that He has for you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.